Hello, this is Benjamin Boyce, and welcome to my ongoing series on gender, sexuality, and transition. Today's guest is Miranda Yardley, who is a prolific blogger and vehemently despised member of the transsexual community. In this interview, we speak about the shortcut that medicalization is seeming to become for people who are trying to fix internal problems by then figuring out that maybe a pill will solve my difficulty with living in the world insofar as the world doesn't necessarily want to facilitate my living in it easily. That's a long-winded way of saying that this is kind of a deep discussion that takes another look at the transgender social phenomenon through the lens of what it means to become a compassionate, self-knowing individual. Is that good? We're just going to run with it. Here's Miranda Yardley. So who are you, Miranda Yardley? I'm Miranda Yardley. I, I'm the world's most hated transsexual, I think. You pretty sure about that? Might be a couple more who are more hated than me. I think. Who's um, the runner-up if I, you're the most? Uh, I think it's probably between myself and Anne Lawrence. Anne Lawrence, okay, yeah. Because of her work, uh, her medical yeah. work. But before we get into the politics, do you want to dive into your biography a bit and what and just describe uh, what when you noticed that you were uh, transsexual or and what the, that condition means to you? Oh, gosh, I, I don't even know where, <clears throat> where to start with that. Um, <clears throat> apart from anything else, I'm so bloody old, it all falls into the deep mists of time. Hmm. Um, I, as soon as I knew what transsexual was, I knew that would apply to me. Now, whether that makes something uh, meaningful out of it, um, I don't know. Um, that there is, uh, there is an analysis of transsexualism and in particular transgenderism that it is kind of, it's, it's a, um, a med it's, it's a medical problem that exists only because there's a medical solution if you get me, there's a word for it that I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, yeah, mm. so as soon as I knew what this was, I, I knew that it applied to me. Um, I was I was very young. Um, I was very confused about a bunch of things. I've been very confused about a bunch of things for much of my life. And uh, a lot of what was involved in my transition was really to do with coming to do with the bunch of things that I was pretty confused about, really. Does gender dysphoria as a term, uh, is that something you identify as having or possessing? Gender dysphoria, that's a good one. Uh, I've spoken about this a few times. I don't think that gender dysphoria itself is a discrete condition. I don't think that it is something that exists as a standalone. It's like, you know, there is, there is no... Uh, there is there is no one such thing as gender dysphoria. It's I think it's something that manifests as a combination of a bunch of things that mainly involve obsessive behavior, uh, depression and, you know, a bunch of other things as well. Okay. Um, I think I think the etiology and presentation of what is what what people mean when they talk about gender dysphoria is pretty is pretty varied uh, i think that there are probably particular types that fit particularly with males um that that um that uh are a different etiology but kind of mean the same sort of thing and i would imagine with um, women as well from some of the um accounts that i've read about it um i, I also don't think that what we classify as gender dysphoria um, or those who use the term body dysmorphia. I don't think that it's unique to people who are transsexual. Okay. But when you discovered the concept or the term transsexual, that mm -hmm. gave you some insight into your confusion, as you say, or a part of being confused? Yes, it did. It did. Um, it's difficult to rationalise it. I've not really been asked about this much before, really. And when I... I've had quite a bunch of counselling in, uh, in my life to try to understand things. And when I've talked a lot about my childhood, 
and how things were being pre-teen and when I was a teenager it got pretty difficult um, and some of my experiences and memories of childhood were not and you know some some periods of my childhood and early youth my childhood my boyhood my youth um were not are, are not resplendent with the best memories um mm. i'd be happy to talk to you about this another time i don't really want to talk about this at the moment um mainly well, just because to... my, 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 my can i just speak to you? mainly because my mother died about a month ago and okay. i don't really want to start talking about that sort of thing Okay. in that kind of context at the moment, because I don't think I could be honest about it. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, just to clarify, the, the difficulty, was that socially? Uh, was that mainly socially, or, or was it kind of internally on on viewing yourself and, and Ma- forming an idea? Mass, yeah, massive, massive social difficulties. Okay. Uh, very, very difficult. Um very difficult i i was very much a boy who didn't fit in okay and i wonder if that prepared you for being a a trans person who doesn't fit in or just being acclimated to social resistance has prepared you to to meet the onslaught um to use kind of slight (coughs) hyperbole or maybe not uh that you received in your adult life once you started acting as a political entity Oh, I think that comes with anybody. I mean, anybody who puts their head over the parapet gets over the parapet gets this in the neck. Um, it's not really something that I looked for. Um, the, the I'll go into the reasons, the hows, and the whys I got into this um, shortly. But it's you know, it's not really something that I looked for. I'm not you know, I'm not a confrontational person. I enjoy discussion and debate, and I enjoy ideas. Uh, I, I particularly enjoy. You know, stress testing ideas, <laughs> see how far they can go, see if things make sense or not. Um, or, you know, see how far things can go. And a lot of what got me involved in it really is just the love of being able to put together a decent analysis and a decent argument. Which, you know, I hope that that's what I've done with a lot of the stuff that I've written. I haven't. You know, I've done it because I enjoy writing, I enjoy thinking about things, but it's got the added bonus in that it also allows me to analyse a lot about stuff, about trans stuff, and understand how my relationship has commonalities with, um, you know, with um, some groups of people and differences with other groups of people. So, you know, I have part of the function of what I've written and what I've talked about has kind of been cathartic in a way. Um, you know, which is pretty cool. Do you have any insight into why this particular realm of ideas uh, evokes so much personal animosity and so much personal investment? It's a very good question. Um, I think that foundational to transgender ideology, and although people will deny that there is a transgender ideology there is a transgender ideology it's very clear uh, it only has to be uh, as much as trans women are women or that gender identity is innate or even exists in the first place and i think that it for the people that believe this it's a faith and it's a faith that's tested every moment of every single day so what we do is we put together a bunch of people who are living their lives in a unstable social construct a man who is dressing and and um performing their own idea of what it is to be a woman going into a society that really that really doesn't like men that do that you know there's nothing worse for a man to do than to have um feminine qualities and I think that it, it, it creates a very unstable environment. I think also the ideology that underpins transgender is is very unstable. And you know, one of my greatest objections to it is that it's that the whole thing is unsustainable as it's not foundational upon reality. Whatever we may consider gender identity to be, and it's a very moot idea. There are a bunch of definitions. Um, of gender identity as there are a bunch of definitions of gender 
And what, whatever that might actually be, it's very clear that this personal idea of something that exists in your head does not translate to your outer body. And whilst that there is this dissonance between the metaphysical and the physical, there is always going to be conflict with the physical because you cannot expect everybody to indulge what is, in fact, a lie. So certain gender ideologies are more stable because they're based on more or less uh, consistent uh, views of the physical body and, and physical attributes and then even social manifestations of, let's say, a woman will, be, will tend to uh, manifest certain uh, aspects and the, therefore is then expected to refine those aspects and a man is you know perceived as generally uh, performing certain roles and then is kind of pressured socially to refine those roles and to maintain a certain sort of uh, behavior uh, and presentation among other people and then swapping those upsets that social construct um i think well I think to um, t to look at how look at how men who are perceived as feminine, particularly men who are homosexual, the insults that are levied at them. You know, you sissy, you pansy, you uh, you, you know. We're talking with British colloquialism here. You know, you, you yeah. bum boy. You 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 know. <laughs> it's uh, you remember that scene from the. Um, that movie to Wang Fu, uh, thanks for everything, Julian Newmar. The what the, the scene where the police officer is chasing. Uh, I think it's is it sort of like Patrick Swayze who's um, who's one of the drag queens. He's trace, chasing the drag queens across the, the county, and he's like thinking, you know, what is it that drag queens like? And it's you know, it's stuff like flowers, you know, and stuff like that. And we have a society, I think, that is very that that has this inherent sexism. That, that in certain circumstances um, manifests itself when dealing with men who are not behaving as men. And, of course, the, the worst thing that a man can be is a woman. And hmm. I think that that sexism is, you know, underpins a, um, a lot of homophobia and what we would encounter as actual transphobia, although much actual transphobia isn't... Is, um, it's difficult one transphobia it doesn't it, it does exist but not where you'd expect to find it um i think that, that you know the problem is deeper i think it's what transgender ideology demands of people that they that the the individual the the trans person believes that trans women are women ergo they are women because they identify as a woman and they have a woman's body because they are a woman and um, as their penis is on a woman's body, it is a woman's penis. You see where this is going. And we live in a world where sexual dimorphism is a real thing. And human beings are generally attracted to one sex or the other. And we reckon, you know, we it, the way that human bodies have or human beings have evolved, the way that many animals have evolved, so many animals have evolved. You can spot who is male and who is female by the physical attributes you know that the, the the biological manifestation of their of their sex and we, we live in a society where people are you know where men are expected to be men and women are expected to be women whatever that may be under gender roles and of course that causes conflict but <clears throat> as a um what what i would say is that i think that most people generally are pretty happy just to let other people live their lives the way that they want to and i i don't think that you know, I, I don't think that the present state of people being triggered literally because somebody misgenders them uh, is, is, you know, is, is particularly stable. I don't think it's a very good place to put anybody. And I think that the inherent instability of the transgender movement is that it's asking the general public, people who do not know you, people who cannot read your mind, to indulge in a lie. And it's not transphobic to... Uh, misgender somebody in the shop but it is sure as hell an abuse of structural power to report somebody on a minimum wage for not giving you access to a female change room because you're a man okay is there a baby in the bathwater kind of situation in society's move or certain aspects or certain contingents of the society trying to uh, diminish homophobia 
and uh, to open up the possibility for men to express their femininity um, in that move towards social relaxation of these rigid concepts of man and wo woman, it seems like things are progressing toward a more accepting of the whole human being, despite um, their, you know, their manifestations of femininity and masculinity. But then the, in the last few years, this transgender ideology, which is trying to nominally trying to release that tension is kind of stirring up a lot more tension by going too far by saying that there's no such thing, not only of gender, but of sex as well. Oh, that's a lot to unpack. Um, I think the, I, I don't think homophobia is in remission. If anything, I think that homophobia is much more uh, subtle. And again, it's, you, you, you need to know where to look for it. The, I don't think there is any political or civil rights movement that is more homophobic than the transgender movement. The way that it, uh, it, it, it places the onus upon homosexuals to consider people of the opposite sex to be of, um, you know, to, to be of the, the same sex. I, I've written stuff on this for, um, it was originally for AfterEllen.com. It, um, it was amazing. I kind of reached my lifetime ambition of being able to write something that had girl dick in the title. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was called... Um, it was called Girl Dick, the Cotton Ceiling and the Cultural War on Lesbians and Women. And I wrote the thing. It was the easiest thing I ever wrote. 3,000 words came out like that. And, uh, you know, it was written from the perspective of someone who's transsexual, who just doesn't take this shit. And the response to it was amazing. When I put when I published it on my own website, I ripped a load of the comments from com just to show exactly why what I wrote, every single damn word, was needed to be said hmm. because the the transgender movement is is homophobic it's, it's homophobia all the way through it it's rotten to the core hmm. so i you say it's homophobia because it's demanding let's say that lesbians be attracted to men who identify as women but it's also homophobic in the sense that it is sculpting budding homosexuals or people who are just in, you know, just entering into uh, sexual activation as just a, a person discovering their sexuality. If a girl happens to be lesbian, it seems like there's some pressure now that that girl should identify as a man, too. Like, it seems like there's this undercurrent of it's easier for this child to... It's easier for me as a parent to think of my girl as a boy that's attracted to women than it is to think of her as a woman attracted to women. It seems like, and not everywhere, but it seems like there's this undercurrent of homophobia at both ends, both in how they're pressuring yeah. identity and then pressuring desire. Yeah, very much. It's one of those ideas that when I first came uh, across the idea that, um, that, that the um, younger people were being uh, trans as a way of confronting their homosexuality. It's one of those things, that, you know, given a moment's thought, I thought, that sounds absolutely ridiculous. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately, that latter statement is not supported at all <clears throat> by the empirical evidence. And you can see very clearly when you look at the stories that you look at the stories and the um, narratives that are given uh, by parents and by the by gender dysphoric children about these children, you can see that behaviour that's coded as being appropriate to the opposite sex is, is being interpreted as if those children are on some level the opposite sex in spite of their body. And we are put into this situation where we we're put into this situation where we have a transgender movement that is itself defined upon social stereotypes and social convention because if it wouldn't be why would you know, you know why would we see so many middle-aged men who decide to transition walking around um from you, you know wearing wearing something that would be in daylight walking around in something that would be in a um in a 16 to 20s goth club 
uh, you know, you can see that it's all based upon stereotypes and con- and convention. And the way that what man and woman means is 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 refi- you know it's like they've backed themselves into a corner what it is being man and a woman is so heavily refined and so tightly defined those boxes are so constrained that if you don't fall into one of the you know you've got to go into one or the other and if you don't you know there are people that don't want to take those boxes and instead of saying to themselves you know let's you know let's let's smash this system of categories and stereotypes and these social conventions that just make us all miserable they're like nope i'm non-binary nope i'm a demigirl nope i'm a whatever type of invention that can be spat out of tumblr or medium.com it is quite quite strange really doesn't it seem to describe some sort of perennial reality of the feminine and the masculine and that people will go to such great lengths to try to avoid it like if it didn't really exist people would just let it go instead of trying to you know reinvent it in a a chaotic manner i don't think it's being reinvented I, i think if anything the social stereotypes um that that code uh male and female are being uh are, are, are being supported and given yeah. more, um, you know, are, are, what's the word? I'm not being reinforced. Yeah. I'm kind of looking for a posher word than reinforced. But, yeah, these these stereotypes are being reinforced. And uh, you, you see with adults, you, you know, with a lot of these p- people, I, what really wants, you know, what, what I really want to get in the head of these people it's is what it means to them to be a man or a woman you know and uh, uh, you know unpacking that understanding to them trying to find out from them what it means for them to be a woman because i'm a woman because i'm a woman is not satisfactory especially when you, you, your body comes um accessorized with a penis and testicles mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i was speaking with several people this past week at a retreat that i went to and one of the things we spoke about was the interaction between uh, men and women and I was having a discussion about people, uh, I, I think it was a, a man, he was talking about how uh, he did, he wasn't able to be in a good relationship with a woman until he had become whole himself, he had become a complete human being. And the way that he described it was that he has, everybody has a, a feminine uh, kind of energy inside of them and a masculine energy. And a lot of relationships that end up burning out quickly is because somebody hasn't really, let's say a man like me, I haven't really come to terms with my own femininity. And so I project that onto women around me. And I'm looking for a woman to rep, to take the burden of my own feminine self. And, and because I'm not I'm not uh, being honest with myself and developing fully into myself, uh, that relationship is going to be codependent in a way. Um, And I wonder if, and maybe this whole way of thinking doesn't, uh, doesn't ring a bell to you, but I wonder if, if insofar as there is a reality behind the stereotype uh, and if we subtract the social expectation and just say that there are certain modes of behavior that are very masculine and certain modes of behavior that are very feminine and they are dimorphized through biology into male and female, but within at least the human animal, they balance one another out on a cultural level. They balance one another out. We have somebody who is focusing on the outside of the home and, you know, structuring reality outside of the home and trying to like bring home the bacon. And you have somebody who is focusing on the inside of the home and making sure that that is a nurturing container for future generations to develop within and whether or not the sexes themselves have to, uh, have to embody those roles those roles still fit into uh, a unity within one another and that specialization of those two can can make for a more uh uh, more fruitful society and by fruitful i just mean a a very productive society that creates more society and creates uh good human beings because they are getting what they need uh with regards to resources and they're getting what they need with regards to let's say the human resource being attention 
that's a long way of going about. I guess my my basic question is, is there not a reality behind these stereotypes? And going after the stereotypes is just going to confuse what those stereotypes are really indicating on a psychological level. I've, I've, I mean, first of all, from what you're saying, um, it, it sounds to me really that um, what you were talking about was people um, becoming more in tune with themselves and... Um, having some having achieved some sort of level of self knowledge which i think is always a good idea for for anybody and you know it, it kind of makes me despair when i see people on social media who clearly have absolutely no self knowledge coming out with some utterly surreal stuff hmm. um i think that there are behaviors that are um uh, are consequential to one's biology uh, I'm not um, philosophically. I'm not a blank slatist. Um, I, I do think that there are certain behaviours that we are predisposed to. The uh, the, the cultural ideas uh, or expectations of what it is to be a woman in the eyes of a transgender male, though, I would consider w were. Uh, particularly unnatural. If you look at the behaviour and the, the the look that many transgender males, and by transgender males I mean a biological male who you know has a has or has had a penis and testicles, a member of the male sex class. I think that the the, the, their idea that you see of what it is to be a woman is so, so often, almost exclusively, you will see a reflection of what you could credibly describe as their own heterosexual sexual orientation. They, they become what they desire or they want to become what they desire as an act of Absolutely. Uh, consummation. Absolutely. They... Yeah. They quite literally become what they love. Okay, and in in, in a certain respect, um, it seems to me that there are transsexual males who don't who are approaching the feminine or trying to embody the feminine not through means of a projection of desire, but a projection of something else. Uh, it seems like there's a, uh, a and maybe the whole term of gender dysphoria is a way of trying to grapple with why a male would feel more comfortable with themselves being perceived as a female or taking female hormones or, or sculpting themselves into the female image that's not based solely on sexual or on a sexual impulse. No, I think for a significant number of transgender males that the gender dysphoria you, you'll see you'll see the um most reputed sexologists who've written about this they will refer to this that the gender dysphoria is the it is the their own conflict with their autogynophilia okay and that is that that's okay. a big deal that's that's a very big deal but when you think about it you know the but one of the first desires of these men is to have feminizing hormones, to have estrogen within within their bodies. This is this kind of validates their idea, their self, their own self diagnosis that they are actually a woman. Because yeah, my body is going to be great on this. The second thing is that the the changing of their body to resemble that of a woman you know the softer skin softer beard uh, the growth of the breast tissue the redistribution of fat that satiates the that that would satiate um anatomical autogynophilia which is the the idea that someone has the fixation that that um so, you know subgroups of these men would have with having uh, a body of a woman you know, so on on certain levels it satiates that. I think as well one of the key functions of estrogen is that um, and the um, the anti testosterone, the anti androgen that they take, is what happens. The either <clears throat> singularly or in combination, 
what these do is these knock out the testosterone production which kind of makes them feel better it changes their smell because they smell like a lady now uh, but critically it reduces their sex drive and i think by attenuating this sex drive and this the sexual inclination that they have that um you know the 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 eroticization that they feel when they are taking themselves out in their role as their idea of, of this woman and you know the, the turn on that they feel and the consequence of masturbation i think that what this does is it uh, by reducing the the sex drive and the compulsion to masturbate it what that does it is addressing a lot of the shame that these individuals feel because the, the because of the shame that they feel about being turned on by being dressed as or fantasizing about themselves as a woman and it makes a happier person because mm. they they're not preoccupied you know you know they can put on their outfit and they're not preoccupied with with knocking one out all the time and as 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 a person they're not put through this this absolute hell of having achieved what you can see is quite a, a euphoric high that is accompanied by an utterly traumatizing low of the, the the shame and despair of what they've just done hmm. do you think that that has something to do uh with the the animosity that is expressed when uh people point out autogynophilia it seems like that that is a really triggering concept because it's uh, re-exciting all that shame that was escaped from through the process of uh, transitioning sexually or trans just transitioning their sex. It seems like there's a lot of resistance to the autogynophilia concept. And I mm, wonder if that's yeah. not because it, it re-excites that entire loop of shame and desire. The, well, I mean, or reduces their identity into a, a fetish, which is, uh, I can see, is pretty shaming. It, it's pretty shaming. They, well, it's this is so this is so complicated. I mean, you know, pretty much every sentence that you're giving me to play with here itself can take a good half hour of unpacking. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how the, we do things around here. Yeah, that's that's good. That's good. Um, the there's a huge amount of irony here in that there is this process whereby these these the, these men are put into a system and they they then become women and the amount of psychological support that these men have it's no longer fashionable to do that uh, i went through you know I, I i had counseling in the early 1990s and you know i'm getting on a bit you know i, I had counseling in the 1990s and throughout the 90s and throughout the noughties and you know eventually when i i went through my transition uh i i stopped my counseling some quite a considerable time after that because i really wanted to make sure that i was okay and i knew what i was doing and that i understood my motivations for it and that i didn't fuck up the life of everyone else that hmm. that was dear to me um Again, that whole concept seems to be deeply unfashionable. <laughs> you know, the number of men that you see going, oh, my wife's a transphobe, she misgendered me over dinner. <laughs> mm. It's, you know, um, the... Mm. I, I think that... Um, I, I think it's terribly sad that people go through all of this and um, the one thing that they don't achieve is any level of self-understanding of why they are the way that they are. Because they're told that they're women, they're told that they have a female gender identity, that they have some sort of spirit, some sort of soul inside them, which is oppositional to their biological sex, and that they feel the way that they do, because they are, you know, because they have a female gender identity. And it's terribly sexist, because what we actually have here is men being told that that feeling sexy means that they feel like a woman, which is, you know, sexism of the highest order, especially when you see that these men become projections of their own heterosexuality. Um, oh, it's, it is also, it is also utterly tragic of King Lear proportions because what they sacrifice in order to achieve this is the one thing 
that brings them that moment of euphoria. Hmm. Isn't that terribly sad, Ben? Yeah. And how did you go through the process of, uh, I think you used the word squaring yourself with what you're doing and, and making sure that it's a part of your path of self-understanding. And, and I asked that in order to possibly give people insight if they are going down this path. What did you learn ahead of them that they can think about and consider? Well, the first thing is that I'm incredibly open-minded and I don't follow crowds. I think for myself, uh, the, what we see now is being claimed as evidence for there, there being a discrete state of one being transgender. It's not based upon any form of science. It's based upon wishful thinking. It's, it's just, it's just puff. Hmm. The amount of psychological support that, individuals who are transitioning go through uh, or that's available is very limited uh, in my day the idea was that you would have two years of counseling and then transition if you thought it was right you know i had transitioning i, trans I had um counseling for a couple of decades really and the you know it, and it was all, you know, it was dealing with how I saw myself, how I felt about myself, my my inner conflicts, how I felt about my, my sexual orientation, a lot to do with my, my, my childhood, part of which was pretty traumatic. A lot of it was to do with thinking about the consequences of my acts on other people as well. And I think that that's important. And I think that the, the consequences of a man who lives like a man saying to the world as well saying to his family you know i'm going to become a woman i'm you know the person that you know and the person that you love is going to go away you're never going to see them again what you're presenting them with is a death hmm. and i don't think that that as a concept is taken seriously hmm. there is a in in western culture there is a tradition that embraces death and rebirth called christianity and it's embedded very very deep into our psychology so much so that i think that most of us don't re really realize that we're acting it out constantly but i wonder if there is a uh, if it if it's strictly a death if there's not a rebirth of the person and if that is a fake rebirth as a woman um, or if it's framed incorrectly well, I'm what I would describe as a hard atheist. I would say that the uh, rebirth as a woman is just as real as the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, but on a psychological level, is there not uh, is there not a sense of being a necessity to be remade and to be renewed as as a human being, to be reborn in a sense? Do you, I, I think it's just so deeply embedded into our culture that we can't really escape from it. And it might be m manifesting unhealthily through using uh, gender as a, as, a, as a new baptism. Um, but if the concept itself, you don't think, has any sort of importance, uh, then I guess you can throw no. everything out. No, it's an interesting idea. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't subscribe to that view myself. Um, my summation there of, uh, sorry, my summarization there of it as being like a death comes from what I've, what people who my own transition have told me has, you know, has affected them. Okay. Okay. And also about what other families have told me. And, you know, I'm not just talking about stuff that's happened recently. This is, uh, I'm talking about people, you know, people that I've known for decades on you know knew of 20 years ago and they went through this and it's like oh my god it's like having a death you know this person no longer exists because that person no longer exists you know when you you're with people you become you become comfortable around them you become comfortable around their habits their name who they are their their identity the things about them that you like having the man who you know who used to who used to uh, uh, used to come home from work and then fix the uh, you know, fix the leak in the loft, mow the lawn, and then you know do whatever else was domestic, uh, and you know do what do all of the the physical and sexual things that come with a loving marriage suddenly turn into 
someone who decides that they're a woman therefore cannot do those things before, therefore behaves in an entirely different manner to the person that they had before because they have completely different interests, many of which are centred on themselves, like, you know, getting rid of their bodily hair, being upset about the state of their arms because they're hairy, you know, wanting to moisturise themselves three or four times a day, refusing to use the lawnmower because women don't do that. You know, I can't go in the loft, especially when I'm wearing high heels. You get me. It's a different yes. person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And how did you, I, did you see that before uh, you transitioned? And, and is that part of what fed into your caution with transition? Because it seems like what you've expressed is that you were incredibly cautious and wary of the process. And by cautious, I don't mean fearful. Maybe that's a part of it, but it seems like you were trying to make sure that it was, you could square with it every step of the way i think that most people um if you spoke to most people about me who knew me before and after transition they would say that the significant change in me with transition was that i wasn't such an awkward bastard hmm. i think that that came from self-knowledge huh it, it wasn't I don't think it was something that just switched on. It was something that took a period of time. Okay. That I, I wonder, it seems like part of our society's problem is that we think we can gain wisdom with uh, a pill in a way. We can medicalize uh, personal development. And tra mm. transgenderism is just one instance of doing that, I guess. And I don't mean to disrespect anybody who is on uh, antidepressants, but it seems like it can be sold or taken, this magic pill that will suddenly give you uh, insight and, and uh, you become a saint in the sense that you can walk on water now because you're no longer troubled by the waves. And it all comes down to that pill rather than an understanding of what it takes to actually become a calm person and, and a compassionate person and rooted in the world in such a way that you are actually decreasing the waves rather than ignoring them or, or being numb to them. Oh, compassion is something that really has gone completely out of fashion. Um, yeah, I think you're right. Just picking up on a point you made about the rebirth, I think that uh, if you look at a lot of the imagery to do with uh, trans people, it's all about butterflies and, you know, you, you were this big, ugly, exactly. hungry caterpillar before and now you've been released and become your true self like a butterfly. You shall fly. Fly, my pretties, fly. <laughs> <laughs> because they're not butterflies. They, they go on the internet and they're flying monkeys on it. You like that all the time. <laughs> Hmm. Um, yeah, there was something else you just asked me as well, which has completely escaped me. What was it? Uh, I don't know. I, I talk and <laughs> my brain's off when I'm talking. I just let the words okay. flow. But I was just talking about um, making sure that any sort of uh, medical process isn't just a, uh, I guess, a sendochi. I don't know uh, if that's the correct term I, for wisdom. I, yes, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Deep. Mm. Well, gosh, counselling. Counselling is now viewed as being gatekeeping. You need counselling, I think, to be able to come to terms with yourself, especially if you're going to do something as daft as having your dick cut off. Um, I think that uh, I think that we're in a society we're in a society where if you've got a question, you go on Google, and point zero one nine seconds later, three billion results are found. To me, everything that I have in life, everything I've ever obtained in life every time i've ever ever had in life has not come easy i've had to i've had you know all the things that i'm interested in doing they require a level of physical fitness they require a a, a level of mental agility because I'm, I'm into maths so i'm always doing stuff uh to do with that because you you lose it you lose it. it's like being an athlete and I think, you know, I think anything that you want, if you, anything that you want to do that you're going to get satisfaction out of, you've got to work hard on it. But we're in a culture now where people don't want to work hard for the result. If they want to have good hair, they don't want to go through the process of looking after themselves, looking after their diet, um, you know, making sure that their, their grooming habits are good or whatever. They're like, I want a hack to make my hair look good. I, I want to I want a hack to I want a hack to deal. With, I want a hack to become a woman. What can I take? I want a pill to take to become a woman. And it's like, you know, it, it's the same on it's the same on a philosophical level. People are not interested in unpacking the real 
difficult reasons why they are the way they are. They just want an easy answer. <clears throat> yeah, you feel like that because you've got a female gender identity. There's an imposter in your body. It's a woman because you're a woman because you've because you've got a female spirit or soul or this this thing in you that tells you that you're a woman even though you're not. Mm-hmm. That is the is the ultimate lazy deceptive hack that to be honest is ruining lives and is having a material effect upon the freedoms and rights of women and uh to play on words you seem to be a inconvenient uh example of the transsexual and by inconvenient i mean you fly in the face of what people want but you also display that it's not just this convenient uh transition because it you didn't it seems like you transitioned but only so far you you never became fully a woman like you never became uh entirely just this sudden feminine entity you you did certain steps of that but you when you when you landed on the other side more or less to use just a turn of phrase you're not this ultimate icon you didn't become this icon of the feminine because you, um, you insist that you're a man and that that flies in the face of what people want to think of as transition. Well, yeah, I think it's um, I think it's quite easy for anybody to get on the back of this transgender bandwagon and say, yes, I'm going to be a woman and, and whatnot. Uh, I would be very happy to be thought of as being a transsexual that got on the transgender bandwagon and said, right. I'm not going to mock women. And the reason okay. that I look the way that I am and, and and whatnot, it's because I will not mock women. Hmm. And yet, because it, a, a lot of it, a lot of what transgender means, it means mocking women. You know, I've heard absurd hmm. stories like people putting, putting makeup and high heels on to go and answer the door to a pizza delivery man. Okay. This actually happens. You know, or people say, "Oh, I need to put some makeup on so I can go to the corner shop and get some milk." What the fuck? The people in the corner shop know you're a man. Get over it. Okay. But to a certain extent, transition helped you to be, as you say, uh, less awkward bloke. So <laughs> there was there was a certain po- part. There was a certain amount of it that was. It seems, what you're saying is that it was good for you, but there's a certain line you think that is bad for society. And I think it's just interesting and inconvenient how you've decided to negotiate that. What's good for you as opposed to what's uh, good for everybody else around you. Well, you have to remember as well, I've been doing this a very long time. You know, I came out 20 odd years ago. Um, I transitioned 11 or 12 years ago. Um, It's, you know, this has been going on a while. And, you, you know, it's not like I suddenly transitioned and stayed fixed as being this particular individual. Um, it, it, and you know, as a human being, I I've, I evolve. We all evolve. I like to think we can all evolve. And you know, my my views haven't haven't remained fixed on things. And I do listen to people, and I do like ideas. And I'm really really bad at holding ideas in my head that that fight what I know to be true. Okay. Okay. And how do you think? <clears throat> How do you think your uh, the the amount of negative attention that you get could be useful to to bring awareness or insight to other people who are kind of in your trajectory as a, as a person and and who need to know that transition is right for them? Have you been able to like pivot like judo style or one of those martial arts where you use the negative force into a positive effect? Um, I think that the I think the positive effect of it is um, is I think we're getting we're getting glimmers of the positive effect of it because people are so sold on this they seem to be unable to believe that transgender people can be anything other than you know quiet demure uh, sad oppressed individuals and not these absolutely dreadfully threatening violent minded sexually threatening individuals that you that you see on twitter i mean you know uh, mm. you look at some of the stuff that people say to women on twitter it's like a stabsy off the scale it how on earth 
did we ever get into a position where people could justify saying that to women or that we have women describing themselves as feminists saying these things to other women it's it is quite something but i think that what the negative attention shows is that the transgender lobby is a very very uncomfortable very very violent uh, antagonistic and a very sexually dangerous place as well i mean there is even even back in my day there was a lot of grooming that would go on with people a lot of um a lot of uh how would i put it you find a lot of predatory people but then you do find that in groups anyway yeah how do you think do you think that it's necessary for the trans lobby to be reinvented and and some house cleaning to happen because it certainly the case that for people for whom medical transition is very necessary to live a fruitful, productive life and to kind of get through some very difficult psychological uh, oppression internally and externally. Um, they need representation. They need lobbying. But it seems like there's a lot of other stuff mixed up in that that is threatening the very people that, that really need the help and transition the most. Yeah, I think it's absolutely shocking. You see what happens now. I mean, the, you know, it's easier to get it's easy to get ten thousand pounds worth of a penile inversion on the National Health Service than it is to get any meaningful counselling here. Mm. Um, you'd have to generally you have to self fund counselling uh, huh. at fifty to seventy five quid for an hour. You could buy a lot of counselling for people. Hmm out of your out of each penile inversion out of each uh, gender reassignment surgery i view gender reassignment surgery as a as a euphemism i think we have to describe it as what it is it is this is extremely brutal um and i think that i think it's very very short termist uh, i think it's particularly repugnant as well the way that the trans lobby have managed to infiltrate places like the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the British, Associ I think it's the British Association of Counselling and Psychotherapy, uh, whereby they, ha they are branding counselling for trans people that's anything other than affirmative as being a conversion therapy when it's not, it's, it's very much going against the evidence that we have. It's, it's totally unscientific because we're not born with brains in the wrong body. It's quite simple. There seems to be a lot of very questionable um, motivation behind the move to make counseling no longer counseling. Counseling means to carefully consider things, right? Counseling means, I, I, I don't know the root, the Latin root of it or anything, but I'm just imagining a council, like people deliberating through a process. And to, to make that deliberation a totalitarian regime of a yes answer, there's something behind that that's very, it has devastating effects, but it seems like the people who don't want to reflect and don't want to deliberate are now forcing everybody else to, are, are taking, are robbing other people of the ability to, to gain self-knowledge. And it seems like, like uh, monstrous that ignorance would perpetuate in that manner. And maybe I'm reading it completely negatively, but it does seem very specious. Questionable. It's very, it's very interesting because think about it. You're on the cusp there of seeing exactly what this is doing. What this is doing is it's taking the responsibility for the consequences of the trans transition from the individual. It's taking responsibility for the, for the transition and for the, the consequences of that from the individual. And essentially it is making it the problem of everyone else. If, you're, if your partner doesn't like it, tough shit, they're a trans folk. If your children don't like it, tough shit, they're little transphobes. If your employer doesn't like it, sue them and retire on the money. If the person down the road doesn't like it, you know, in the, in the, if the person in the local shop doesn't like, um, misgenders you, go on Twitter and complain about it and make sure he goes out of business. It is an abdication of personal responsibility. I don't think it'll end well. <laughs> it's, it's really sad, but it's... <laughs> no <sad>. shit! <laughs> <laughs> and 
so describing that dire situation, how do we go about protecting people who need to be protecting, protected and protecting them from the people who are saying that they are the protectors of these people? This is the weird thing about progressive ideology, hyper progressive ideology. I don't know the correct term, but this activist mentality where it is hijacked time and time again by people who do more damage to the people they're trying to support or be allies to than than the world at large. And I wonder if there's a way to cut them off at the pass by addressing the root cause of, let's say, homophobia or people being bullied, if that if that it is, if that's what it is, if, if there's if there can be more leniency in the way in which men treat other men who do not live up to the ideal of man, that will cut the wind out of the sails from the people who are going about trying to fix the solution by creating a much, much bigger problem. Wow. How long have you got? Okay, here's how we deal with the problem. Um, we ensure that nobody who has transitioned, and I use the word transition, I don't actually believe that transition does anything. I, I think it's a meaningless concept. Um, hmm. But anybody who has transitioned is uh, automatically barred from working with with adults and children, especially children who are um, who are um, gender dysphoric or confused about their bodily sex, and that those those individuals who have encouraged children to transition and or operated on children with uh, and by children I mean anybody under the age of eighteen, preferably anyone under the age of twenty five. I would really like to see them rounded up and put in jail and made to be responsible for what is actually a completely regressive and utterly inhuman experimentation on young people. I would like to see um, what's the name of the surgeon who operated on Jazz Jennings? I don't recall. Is it Marcy Bowers or something like that? Or is that a comedy character? Uh, I think well, that it's all comedy right now. We're in the dark. We're in the dark. Th it's circus. this is this is so not dark. The the surgeon who operated on Jazz Jennings was a man who who became a surgeon and transitioned and has now taken away from Jazz Jennings the ability to have a functional sex life and be having a sex life is is part of what makes us human. He is responsible for taking away the humanity of that child and he should be put away. And any, the, the surgeons who are removing the breast tissue from young women, they should be put away in prison and we should be using fact-based and evidence-based uh, research to decide how to deal with the problems that we have. We do have problems with homophobia and sexism within society. Uh, we frequently see uh, liberal-minded people, particularly those who call themselves progressives. Most people who call themselves progressive are as regressive and as right-wing as fuck. And they are, they, are not, um, they are not contributing to any positive evolution within society at all. Um, and yeah, they, yeah, we need to stop listening to these people as being the voice of, of what is, of what, of what matters and realize that what they're talking about is, is incredibly regressive. We, we, we as human beings, what we are as human beings, our, our biological sex is, is just part of who we are. It doesn't have to categorize us as being one thing or something else. And behaviors that young children exhibit that that one would view as being typical of the opposite sex do not mean that that child's body is wrong for their personality. Well, I don't know about putting everybody in prison. Um... I'm not talking about everybody. <laughs> I just mean the people that are... The people that are people who are exploiting this. Yes. The people that are exploiting this. I I cannot see any justification why, for example, Jazz Jennings had had to have his penis removed. I mean, that was just like 
I, I, if it were, if this was something trivial, it would be a gong show. But it's not. This is not something trivial. This is something absolutely serious. A 16-year-old boy cannot consent to have his penis turned inside out. A 16-year-old boy who's never had any sexual experience of his own cannot consent to that happening. The whole mm. premise underneath it is absolutely flimsy. And the people that are doing this are just cold-hearted opportunists money grabbing opportunists and the ex what is motoring a lot of this problem is the amount of money that sloshes around around it hmm. and that money is there because of a lobby or because of a societal acceptance of this or it's because if you can hit them in the money companies... how do we hit them in the money well many many uh, many organized organizations and governments and banks and whatever they're all like you know we we want to support society you know we, we we've 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 got all this money from the government to keep us going because our senior employees nearly made us bankrupt 10 years ago mm. <laughs> um so what mm. should we do with all the profits that we're making uh well we need mm. to put them somewhere good right what's happened to the gay lobby oh, they've gone away because they got equal marriage okay so the gay and lesbian lobby let's cross that off uh what about the trans lobby yeah let's give money to the trans lobby the amount of money slushing around from our national lottery from local authorities from the government from corporations into trans is absolutely off the scale you get trans groups are that they are they they are breeding like gremlins hmm. <laughs> quite literally you know yeah, they are this nice little fluffy idea just add the just add the water <laughs> of social justice and gender identity and before you know it you've got this thing that's on the internet giving you all sorts of shit <laughs> <laughs> that's a really uh, but no it's it it, it, it's it's that's where the money's coming from lots of people talk about big pharma and all that I, I don't believe it it's it's about all the money is is in it it's the money's there the, the people that are making the money are the people who are part of the transgender diversity industrial complex the the uh the doctors the the counselors who preach affirmation the offshore pharmacies uh, the, the surgeons who are mutilating young people who are confused rather than saying, hey, you know, it's, it's going to be all right. Okay. Because, you know, it is going to be all right. Nobody has to go through this. Okay. That's the core. I I, I want to say that the, that's the core. The, the, the counselor needs to establish the, the goal of things going to be okay. Let's let's carefully go through this. Once we once yeah. we put that in place, then we can carefully deliberate through the problems. But if that that goal of things are going to be OK is swapped out with this medical solution that that defers the actual solution, which is a better, fuller life, a, a, a less awkward human being, a more engaged, go. compassionate entity, social entity. How sweet that we seem to have come around in a circle back to what I said about it being a medical problem only because we have medicine to deal with it. Yeah. That was the one statement that launched a thousand words, I guess, or a thousand sentences. Yeah. Should we wrap it there? I think that's the perfect place to wrap it, Miranda. I think so. Would you would you like to come back again at some point? This is a very oh, stimulating very nice of you to ask me. conversation. I, thank you. I, Maybe I in the actually, future someday. Yeah, sure. I do think about this. Um, you, you know, I know that a lot of the stuff that I say is a bit sounds a bit strong, um, and is is very very. A lot of people view it as very very confrontational, but I'm not saying it to be mean. I, I'm I've lived this life. I'm being honest. Mm 